Well, I think um, I think we best make a start. Uh, welcome everybody to today's event. Just another reminder: we are recording the session. Uh, this is a virtual edition of the long-running Open Research London event series, and today's event is about findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable fair data in practice. Before I say anything more about today's topic, or we begin to introduce the, the speakers, um, some important housekeeping. So as I've said twice already, but just another reminder, the event's been recorded, so be aware, anything, anything shared today will be recorded in high definition and widely distributed on the internet. So please bear that in mind in all our interactions today. Um, we will be taking questions um, for our speakers and panelists. Um, the way that we're doing that is via the chat function. So do feel free to uh, raise your questions in the chat. We will do our best to monitor those and capture those and, and feed those into the discussions. Um, and we'll try and get to as many of them as possible. Okay, um, one or two more people just joining. Um, just a final reminder, um, we're live, we're recording. So the discussion today is about sharing, discovering and reusing research data. Uh, this isn't a new topic in open research, um, reflected in part um, by our focus today on not if and why we should be concerned with, with FAIR data, but how we should do it, how to implement the FAIR data principles. Um, the FAIR data principles themselves were published more than five years ago now, um, and as well as lending themselves to a convenient and quite pervasive acronym in FAIR, is that they include a lot of detail on how to support data discovery and reuse. And there's actually a very strong focus in the FAIR principles paper on enhancing the ability of machines to automatically find and reuse data, as well as helping humans to, to do the same. So they remain quite forward-looking and aspirational. And those kinds of requirements, it leads to lots of details to consider for, for, for different stakeholders. Uh, details regarding metadata and licenses and controlled vocabularies and, and infrastructure and repositories. Uh, so naturally, that uh, may invite discussions about how and by whom the implementation of these principles should best be carried out. Um, we may lead ourselves to questions about what are the benefits, what are the incentives of, of implementing fair data practice. The, the good news is we can begin to assume a bit of prior knowledge among researchers about the concept of fair data, about the fair data principles. Um, for anyone who's familiar with the state of open data surveys uh, run by Digital Science, very large survey of researchers, and they've been for the last few years asking the extent to which researchers are familiar with the FAIR principles, and more than half of researchers are now reported to be familiar with FAIR, and that's been increasing over the last three years or so. But as well as awareness, uh, an important consideration is also the extent to which FAIR da data practices help or are perceived to help researchers achieve the tasks they're trying to get done each day. Um, one benefit of FAIR is enabling data discovery and reuse, and this is something multiple studies have estimated more than half of researchers need to do regularly, need to find research data to, to reuse, to, to, inform, to inform their own, their own work. And, and that, that important principle of enabling data reuse was, was reflected in uh, one piece of research that I was, I was pleased to be involved with. And we found that somewhat conversely, uh, while researchers are, are quite happy with their ability to share their own data, um, they have concerns about their ability to obtain data from others to reuse and, and also to obtain data that's available on request, um, such as from, from, the published, from the published literature. Um, so these, these sorts of issues speak to the role, not just of researchers, but of other stakeholders in implementing FAIR in practice, including publishers, of course, which is a group I represent. And I should, of course, um, introduce myself as well. So um, I represent publishers, essentially. I'm Ian Trinaskiewicz, Director Open Research Solutions at PLOS Public Library of Science. So, but as well as publishers, funders and institutions are, of course, very, very important. And 
funder and institution policy is changing with respect to research data, data management and FAIR. And funders that, that may well be familiar to uh, audiences here and, and researchers at the Crick in particular, Medical Research Council, Wellcome Trust, Cancer Research UK, National Institutes of Health in the US. These are all funders that do now have some form of policy relating to data sharing and, and data management. And that's, that's very relevant um, and important for research, but also, um, also for institute, institutes as well, who may well be tasked or, or carrying some responsibility for supporting the implementation of those principles. But I also think it's important to take a global view and, and to acknowledge that, well, a lot of these funding agencies that I've mentioned uh, may be um, ahead of the curve with respect to research data policies. They actually remain in the minority of global funders with respect to having, having um, strong, or strong, strong policies on these aspects. Um, and just to, to finish my, my, my brief bit of context, um, I talked about institutions and I talked about the CRIC, um, who are hosting today's webinar um, as part of Open Research London and actually poised some quest posed some questions, questions that they have about FAIR in practice and, and are hoping today's speakers uh, will offer some, some insight sight on. So I'll just, I'll just pose a couple of those questions before we uh, get into introducing the speakers. So things like what, what, uh, what do institutions need to put in place to support researchers uh, implement FAIR data? What skills do researchers or other specialists need to have to support uh, FAIR data? What's the role of IT and infrastructure? And um, thinking even more broadly, how do we change the culture around fair data? How to ensure it's a benefit rather than a burden to researchers? And I think also importantly, are there any potential unintended consequences of, of implementing uh, fair data or considering some of the, the uh, problems to be, to be solved that we'll talk about today? But fortunately, we have a galaxy of star speakers who can talk about the principles, but also importantly for today, the practice of fair data with much wisdom and experience. Um, so I'll introduce each of the speakers briefly um, with their name and their affiliation, and then we'll turn it over to the first of four 10 minute or so presentations. So we have Jen Gibson, Executive Director at Dryad, who will be speaking first, followed by Philippa Matthews, Group Leader at Francis Crick Institute. Uh, we also have Jean-Baptiste Pauline uh, joining us from Montreal Neurological Institute and McGill University. And we also have Claudia Engelhut from Gottingen State and University Library. And we also have an additional uh, panelist joining us for the discussion, uh, James McRae, who is head of metabolomics platform at the Francis Crick Institute. So um, there are about 10 minutes per speaker. Uh, per presentation, and that should leave us a good 20 minutes, he says, always famous, hopeful first words, we'll have plenty of time for discussion, um, but the programme does hopefully leave us a good 20 minutes or so, and maybe even a, a closing minute of remark for, from each of, each, each of the speakers. Um, I will keep an eye on the chat as we're going, and uh, if we keep to time, we should have time for one a question at least for each presentation after the presentation, and then we can you know, pick up on broader themes or questions as um, as we get onto the discussion part. So, um, with just a quick cursory cursory look at the chat. Um, so, there's a question about slides. Yes. It's only the title slide at the moment. Um, there were no slides to go with my, my little introductory monologue. Um, and thanks, Frank, actually, I can see you've answered it. So I'm gonna turn it over, I'm gonna stop sharing, and then I'm gonna hand over to, uh, to Jen, and hopefully you can share and, um, and get going with your presentation. Thanks very much, Ian. All right, are my slides can make sure you're all right. Great, thank you. So as a, a great introduction, thank you. Um, there has indeed been a lot of um, great uh, progress and interesting developments with respect to, to data sharing over the last little while. Um, for, for my own part, I've just joined Dryad as executive director in October. 
And when I was going through the application process, I was reminded of the open data principles um, that were signed at the Penton Pub in Cambridge, I feel like it was 15 years ago, that I had a hand in, in promoting at the time. So for me, things are, are coming full circle, and it's a fantastic opportunity to be talking about data. So thanks very much to um, uh, Ian for your intro, and, uh, and Frank and Kate uh, for your work in, in organizing and, and bringing us here today. Uh, many of our, our guests may be familiar with Dryad uh, as a, a data repository, a long-standing since around 2009. But as, as we speak today, um, as, I, as I offer you um, some thoughts, I'd like to invite you to recharacterize Dryad in your mind as an open data publishing platform. The work that we do to make data fair or findable, um, accessible, interoperable, and reusable, and to bring it to life for the benefit of future users is, is publishing. And we're also a community at Dryad. We're a community of like-minded uh, stakeholders, uh, publishers, uh, institutions, librarians, funders, researchers, committed to a vision whereby all research data is not only openly available, but routinely reused. So that's the end game we're, we're driving for here. The way that we feel we can do that at Dryad um, is by enabling and promoting the reuse of research data on our platform. So through our platform, as I, I hope to, um, to demonstrate to you today, we help to make the sharing of data easy and powerful for researchers and the case for data reuse, a compelling one. We are a generalist open data publishing platform. Uh, we do uh, publish data across all disciplines, but our emphasis is on data that doesn't already have a home in a specialist depository. We publish exclusively research data, so uh, we no longer take supplementary information or software. We partnered with Zunodo to, to make that happen. The data we publish is fully curated uh, by a team that I'll describe in a moment, and Dryad is a, a not-for-profit organization. My final slide on a little bit of context for us is that the platform today uh, has about 43,000, over 43,000 data publications associated with the work of over 175,000 researchers, 32,000 institutions, and 1,200 academic journals. So Dryad is growing rapidly. We're bringing more journals and publishers and, and, and institutional members on board all the time, uh, but this is a snapshot for, for what we look like at the end of, of last year. The way, our, our, the way that we feel that we can help and our strategy for achieving um, fair sharing is to make it as easy as possible for the user. Now, if my timing is right, I should have a minute to speak to, to this framework um, that Brian Nozick at the Center for Open Science um, introduced some years ago, which is a framework for achieving cultural change in research and communication and open sharing. So, um, so Frank uh, blogged in, in the last couple of days around the kind of the state of conversations around FAIR and how you know, there's a lot of, of, of talk about the principles, adherence to the principles, adoption of the principles, but not a lot of clarity around implementation and, and impacts on the ground. So I think that, that Brian's framework is, is really handy here because, you know, once we adopt principles and we, we set ourselves on a path um, toward a vision that we all support, we first need to build the systems that make it possible but then we need to make it easy for researchers, for users to engage with these platforms and, and, and conduct the behavior that we want them to do. So, so this is the layer that I'm going to describe um, and, and put uh, Dryad's work into. At Dryad, though, also, I have to say that I'm really enthusiastic about building these communities of practice or doing whatever we can at Dryad to, to nurture those communities and, and, and get them um, better connected with one another, but also shining a light on them so that other, other communities, other disciplines can, can learn from their experience. So to, um, to describe uh, what, how Dryad um, makes it easy for researchers um, to share their data in a fair way, I'm just going to walk you through quickly the, the publication process, just give you a few examples of, of how we do this. 
So again, our strategy is to um, to change our processes and our and our systems and our service in a way that make the data um, fair with as little intervention from the researcher um, as we can. So we make it transparent for the for the researcher, make it completely easy. So these things are are, are happening; they're baked into the process, but they don't really even know. So I'll see see if you. Um, See if you follow as I as I, I try to present that to you now. So starting at the top, um, uh, all uh, authors, um, researchers, uh, publishing data with Dryad have to have an ORCID. So this is uh, essential for interoperability reasons. Um, they, they have to have an ORCID in order to log into the platform. And if they don't have one, um, we'll help them to, to go get one and come back. Uh, they then uh, uh, let us know whether the data set is associated with an article in consideration at a journal or already published at a journal or neither. That's not a requirement for, for publishing with Dryad. And then um, in collecting information about the data set, we connect with other indices wherever we can. Again, for purposes of, of interoperability as well as discovery downstream, um, for example, the affiliation information uh, is pulled from the research organization registry. We'll take as many keywords from authors as we can get, again, for, um, for discovery purposes especially, and we do require a readme file to be connected with the data uh, that describes how later users can, can run it. So in, in talking to, to researchers, I like to remind them to think about their future selves as well as potential collaborators. So if you go back on this work in 10 years time, what are the little hints and tips you'd like um, that you need to put out there to remind your future self of, of how to use this data? If there are related files already out there, we ask the author to let us know. And if they need to load software or supplementary information in connection to this particular data set, we make that easy to do through the Dryad submission forms. And uh, through our partnership with Frictionless Data, we check tabular data for basic errors before it gets uploaded. So small things like blank headers or merged cells can throw a spoke in the wheels for users trying to run the data later on. So frictionless draws attention to that so that these little things can be cleaned up before the data um, upload process is complete. Then the data is handed over to our team of curators on the ground, uh, which interfaces with the author. Um, they first of all check the data for um, sensitive information. We don't publish anything that um, includes uh, identifiable human subjects uh, or location data for endangered species. So those basic checks are, are run every time. We also want to make sure that there isn't any um, anything in the package that can't be licensed under a CC0 license, which is the default for the Dryad platform. And then they check to make sure that the file types are as accessible as possible using open software formats, if possible, otherwise common software formats, um, and that the, the readme um, is something that anyone can pull down and take a look at. So um, it very much like a, like a publishing process, we've got a team of people who interface with the author to make sure that we've got all the information we need to facilitate the downstream uh, use and, and, and consumption of this uh, research object. And then it all comes together uh, in, a, in, a, in a lovely presentation on the Dryad website. You know, again, looking at this from my point of view, it looks a lot like a research article. You've got your, your title readily available, the author affiliation uh, information, publication, citation stuff all right there. Um, and then the, the other objects, whether they're software or uh, supplementary information or a research article, those are readily linked up on, on the right hand side. So I'm, you know, particularly enthusiastic about uh, the opportunity for the, this type of presentation because it encourages and facilitates human interaction with the data, it, uh, enabling the, you know, the connection and discovery and use of the data for humans and machines is, 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 is important on, on both sides, but it's the humans who are going to make the decisions about research assessment and, and what people should get credit for. So I'm particularly keen about elevating data for the benefit of, of other investigators so that they begin to give one another a credit for, for this work. So um, one of the flags that I, that I carry for open research. Finally, um, from me, uh, this is all made possible with the support of our, our publisher sponsors and through our institutional memberships. So um, 
in part in, in answer to one of, of the Crick's questions, what can we do? One opportunity here is to support systems like this that ease the, the burden, make it uh, easier for the institutions and also easier for researchers to just um, take care of, of fair concerns on your behalf. So that's what Dryad's institutional members invest in. We've got about 45 of them worldwide at the moment, I think, and uh, they invest in Dryad so that their uh, researchers on their campuses can um, deposit data with us. And similarly, the, the publishers um, that we work with sponsor their authors so that the authors don't receive a bill for publishing data with Dryad that's tied to their the publications in those journals. Um, so it's often free for researchers and will be increasingly free as we're able to, to strike more of these, these arrangements. So um, in, in summary, um, as a starting off for our, our discussion this afternoon, um, Dryad's strategy for uh, making data uh, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable is to build those, uh, the functionality required to support that in our platform. With that, I will stop and I'll look forward to chatting with everyone um, in the next hour or so. Thank you. Thank you, Jen, and thank you for staying so well to time. I should also correct um, some of the housekeeping. It looks like the Q&A function is working and we have a question in the Q&A function. Um, so I'll ask this, this, uh, I'll ask this one uh, for you, Jen, as, as we've got time for a, for a quick question or two. So the question is, what level of resource is needed uh, to do the liaison between Dryad and the depositor? How big is the team and how long does, it, does a data set take? Are there any issues that come up regularly? So maybe a sort of the overall theme is sort of, you know, how much effort, what's the resource in order to provide that service? It's highly variable. Um, there are simple data sets where, you know, the author has given us everything that we need up front. And so there's, you know, we just confirm and say thanks very much. And then there are more complicated situations where uh, we just have to go back and forth with the author over a number of different concerns. Um, they may have asked for the data to remain private for peer review, and then we need to open it up later when the, the paper's been accepted for publication. Um, there may be large data sets that we have to move on to our, our VPN to process. So um, I I'm, uh, as a new executive director, I'm looking to, to hone in on those average times myself now, so I'm not able um, to report them right now. I'll be happy to do that later. But generally speaking, um, we're receiving about uh, 2,300, 2,500 uh, data submissions in a month, and we've got a team of uh, six part-time curators, uh, trained researchers handling the data sets. So um, it's, I don't know, it can always be faster, um, but, uh, but it's, it's pretty robust today. Thank you. There's another couple of questions. One I think is particularly interesting, but I think we'd better save that for the, for the, for the, for the discussion. Uh, let's move on to our second speaker, uh, Philippa Matthews, um, who's going to be talking about fair data for clinical academia. If you're ready to share your screen, Philippa, then go Thanks, for it. Ian. I will hope this works. Does that look okay? Great. Great. So thanks very much, um, Ian, for the introductions and colleagues at the Crick for convening this, this event, which is great. This is a, a topic that I'm passionate about. I'm not necessarily an expert, but I've um, thought about it a bit over the years. So um, sharing some insights um, from the perspective of a clinical academic. So when I was thinking about um, how to title and frame this talk, I was on, on my commute through Marlebone Station and saw this massive sign up above my head saying fed up with companies selling your data, which really made me think, you know, data is now um, such a topic uh, that's in the public domain that we are all thinking about it all the time. And actually the way that we handle data um, scientifically and clinically is suddenly a topic that's really uh, very much front line, and this is no longer something that's kind of a, a niche academic topic. And that's also exemplified by what's been going on really recently in the media, and you, you probably have all seen these kind of headlines, um, which are really kind of detrimental in many ways to the, the access and use of clinical data, but do point out that there's a, there's a real need for careful governance and careful thought and careful messaging um, about how we do this activity. So just by way of my own context, I'm an infectious diseases clinician and I now run a, a new research group at the Crick um, focusing on hepatitis B virus infection. So we generate laboratory data and we also use clinical data sets and some of those really focus on 
digging down deep into individual characteristics and others which I'll talk about in a bit more detail are these really big population data sets that are increasingly accessible. And of course, all of these um, potentially present their own challenges. So reasons to champion fair data have really been headlined um, at, at the beginning of the session and hopefully you know, lots of you are, are on board with this already. And I, I certainly don't propose to go through all these kind of individual um, attributes of, of data sharing, but I think we're in a field where this has moved very fast and the, the potential to come out of, of fair data um, has become very clear. So there are lots of reasons to do this and to, and to do it well. The converse um, is also unfortunately still the case and there are plenty of reasons to opt out and these are nice cartoons that I've, I've got from this the, the link that you can see there online but essentially all the reasons and these are familiar to all of us around why we might not get around to doing this or it might not get done in the best possible way and I'm going to pick up on on some of these themes as points for discussion. So I don't have time and it's not worth the effort. Well, I think this this actually is, is about culture change in a way and, and why it might be worth our effort and how the culture has changed so that we can see that it's worth an effort. But I think when I was uh, kind of a junior investigator in the system, there was this idea that data belonged to maybe the principal investigator and maybe the university at which it had been generated. But I really now think we've moved on from that and we exist in this era where there are so many stakeholders and the, the roles and responsibilities um, and rights of these individuals all need to be recognised. And I really think we should move on from a culture of owning data to saying, well, we're data guardians. And that actually does involve uh, making it available for reuse. I think this has really been highlighted by the pandemic. So there's there's plenty of examples of this. Actually, the one I've put up on the screen is about hydroxychloroquine. So you'll remember early on, there was a, a kind of a drive to say that this might be a, an interesting therapeutic agent. Um, and this was very, uh, very rapidly kind of taken down. And part of that is around actually data sharing. Um, it's about rapid dissemination of data, it's about um, transparency, it's about access to combined data sets and open discussion, duplication where it's needed to replicate findings. Um, so this is a, a kind of story of, in a way, the successes of, of fair data uh, in, in the extreme situation of a pandemic. This is a paper that I actually wrote myself a few years ago, so this is pre-pandemic era, those the olden days before COVID. Um, but talking about fairness in two ways, obviously recognising the new uh, acronym of, of fair data, but also thinking about fairness in the conventional sense, which is around equity and justice. So again, who, who do these data belong to and for what purpose can they be used? So the idea that this is only for, for certain domains like engineers or mathematicians is wrong. Um, so this is a, a, a panorama of Kailicha suburb in Cape Town, South Africa, where uh, patients with hepatitis B are, are among those that we recruit into our clinical cohorts. And you can get a sense from that photo of the kind of living conditions that people exist in there. And we know that um, you know, the, these, these situations and these settings have been grossly underrepresented and indeed in many cases abused by the research process. And the process of trying to redress and work, work towards better equity uh, does center in many ways on, on fairness of ownership, um, fairness of guardianship, fairness of sharing, so that we can get these populations better represented. And individuals in these settings are um, offering themselves as volunteers into clinical studies, then we should be handling their data with, uh, with integrity and equity. So publishing models have really changed over time. And since I've got interest in the publishing arena, I think the ground has moved very fast uh, and there's, there's lots of improvements, but clearly things like this tweet still kind of highlight some of the, the challenges and how, uh, how difficult the system can be. So lots of scam factors to highlight. I've talked about the global inequities. The peer review process does not always function equitably. The profit reward system of academic publishing leaves much to be desired in many cases. Um, and of course, academic metrics uh, can be a real driver of behavior. And in fact, if you drive academics to say that all that matters are citations and impact factor, uh, then fair data often doesn't get really much of a look in. But this is being innovated and disrupted 
There are lots of new models of publishing, recognizing the value of data per se. So not necessarily what p-values you get out or how this translates, but the value of having collected and curated a very careful data set in its own right. Um, lots more open review and lots more uh, wider imperatives, which are going to be really important to drive fairness in both senses of the word. Fair data um, that that uh, or, or or data that's too unique to fit one standard is another potential barrier. But of course, there's lots of opportunities emerging for the storage and curation of all sorts of different databases. So, just some of the examples that we might use in clinical research for storing sequencing data, structural data, imaging data, and of course, um, that list could could go on. So another big challenge that's, that's specific really to the clinical arena is uh, the thoughts about the, the concerns about personal and confidential data, um, which, which needs some real careful attention. And there's quite a lot emerging in this space. And I'm just going to spend the next um, couple of moments thinking about what these are and what the challenges are still remaining. So some this, this paper published about sharing radiology research uh, um, reviewed lots of different journals practice and found that there's still quite a lot of inconsistency, that there might be mismatched requirements between funders and publishers, and that when you come to publish your data, you can't necessarily find clear instructions about how to share, what to share um, in terms of your, your metadata set. Um, Another example is uh, sharing data from clinical trials. Now, when you set up a clinical trial, there's a huge statistical uh, review process that happens as, alongside uh, the trial protocol, which is to make sure that that data gets analysed correctly. So it would then be really paradoxical to um, eject a whole load of data into the public domain for anyone to analyse in, in whatever way they, they wanted. So there's this kind of difficult balance potentially between wanting to share and make um, open access for the data and to make it reusable versus also protecting very carefully curated data sets from erroneous um, or biased or spurious um, analyses. And again, the, the issues of privacy and, and confidentiality. And some routes around this have been found both by the um, Access CV and also this other um, Yoda uh, uh, um, platform which which has a similar aspiration so putting in place basically some criteria to try and protect the data while also allowing it to be released and that's around thinking about timelines it's around careful processing of requests to make sure they're appropriate um, and that they're considered by a diverse um, specialist review group and that the whole process is undertaken um, and reported transparently so this is another example of healthcare data that I've been involved with personally as a consultant for the NIHR Health Informatics Collaborative. And this really aims to collect um, routinely uh, routine clinical data. Uh, so from hospital um, electronic health records in this instance, uh, to clean it and curate it and anonymize it and then to make it reusable for research purposes. Um, and the, the web diagram here looks rather complicated, but essentially the, the take home point here is drawing the clear operational boundaries between what's in the hospital setting on the on the left of the dashed line and what's released into the research domain on the right. Another really good example of this that's arisen during the COVID pandemic is Open Safely, which is a massive um, data collection of primary healthcare records. Um, so over 58 million people represented. And if you if you Google this and log in, the very first thing that you get on the front page is how do I know my data is safe? Um, and this is a really interesting structure where, in fact, the clinical data are all kept at arm's length from the researcher, but the researcher can submit code and can run this on a mock data set. Once the code's all working and error check, then the code gets submitted and the research team run the code on the live clinical data set. Um, and then the code is shared and the output is shared, but the clinical data all remains behind that uh, very carefully protected um, firewall. So just to conclude on a couple of challenges, I do think findability and interoperability are a problem. Um, we've, uh, we've talked about all the different and the flexibility and the different ways of sharing data sets, which in many ways is an asset for all the different kinds of data that emerge. But then you end up with these situations where there are so many diverse approved repositories that in fact, if you're trying to find something, you may not be able to. So there's definitely um, a, a need to link this up. 
um, and and think about how we how we work towards better findability despite these these diverse options for sharing. So one size doesn't fit all, but some approaches might include uh, how we better train our research community, how we invest to support institutions, funders and publishers um, for data sharing, uh, how we try and streamline our data collection uh, processes and adopt consistent approaches um, and learning from the innovators, because there are there are many platforms that are now uh, really putting uh, new, new innovations in place. So I think we've got lots of opportunities expanding platforms for sharing diverse data, huge amount of thought and investment going in from, from all sorts of quarters, um, and actually the, the innovations and experiences and learning that's come out of the COVID pandemic on, on how we deal with these huge data sets. Um, so I'll close there. Thanks to um, everyone who's been involved in, in running the session and also to my um, funders and collaborators uh, and my contact details are up there if you want to contact me directly, but clearly looking forward to discussion as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Philippa. I'm just um, waiting a few moments in case anyone is, is pushing out that, that, that bit of text into the chat or, or elsewhere. Um, I think we can move on to the next speaker. Um, and, and enjoy some questions about uh, the topics you raised and others in, in, in the panel discussion. So now I am pleased to introduce Jean-Baptiste Pauline um, from Montreal Neurological Institute and McGill University again. And Jean-Baptiste is going to be talking about implementing fair data in neuroscience and neurology. We can see your slides. I don't know if you're talking, Jean-Baptiste. Um, we didn't have any audio. Yeah, my, my apologize. I, I've, I've got the, um, the mute uh, on and I couldn't uh, unmute until I reshare things. So uh, let me share my screen now. It, it, it always happens once. So <laughs> <laughs> carry on when you're ready to share your slides. Um, here we go. Can you see my screen? Yes. Thank you. And, uh, and thanks a lot for the introduction and, uh, and the invite, uh, and also to the uh, previous speakers. It was uh, fantastic so far. The, um, the, the, the thing I want to talk about today is, uh, is a little bit of a, you know, what uh, we had in terms of the, uh, the problems and the, uh, and the solution for our own experience at the MNI uh, in, in my field of, uh, of neuroscience and neuroimaging data. Um, and uh, and clearly, as uh, previously said, you know, fair doesn't come with a toolbox. Uh, it's a, it's a set of principles. It's kind kind of detailed, uh, but uh, you quickly hit uh, a number of things. And uh, and and my I will lay out quickly, you know, uh, the mini mini mission, few resources problem, uh, the challenges in verification in neuroscience and neurology, and uh, and give you an example uh, from the MNI uh, and a couple of take home message. So the problem of the many mission few resources is that uh, you know uh, find data uh, when no one agrees on how to uh, describe those things and where to search for. I mean, do we should we you know push everything to Google Scholar, Dryad, Zenodo, or have a specialized repository? Uh, access data in the context of governance, ethical and legal constraints, and that's uh, what has been like a, a constant uh, impediment. Uh, integrate with other data when uh, no one knows how to actually uh, what are the standards to actually you know, uh, link data uh, together uh, or reuse things uh, when the initial purpose may not be the one you would now have or, or your, your own self, uh, as uh, was uh, previously said. Uh, so the good thing is clearly that we are actually uh, in a phase where fair data has to come out uh, and there's a, a lot of a social tool and, and funding push and institutional push. Uh, however, uh, the bad is that the resources are still not there. And the ugly is that I think the incentives are still not there either. Uh, the research community basically uh, often see data sets uh, uh, as assets for more publication because that's the primary currency of our research uh, academic system. 
the clinical community has uh, rightly uh, very uh, strongly uh, focused on the data privacy uh, and the institutions and publisher events uh, are really like about risk management and sometimes profit. Uh, so, uh, so I will give you one example of a platform that we've built uh, with the idea that uh, we really had to uh, go through uh, standardization and community building aspects. Uh, and the principle of the platform, the uh, uh, Canadian Open Neuroscience platform, is really about interoperability and, the, uh, and embedding the governance ethics uh, as well as training in the platform uh, for uh, verification of uh, neuroscience data. So the principle on which uh, we've built the platform is that we actually don't want uh, to centralize the data themselves, but we really want to centralize the metadata capable uh, of uh, linking to the data outside of the uh, of wherever they are and wherever they are hosted and what we've uh, you know the, their own governance aspect. So the uh, so what we've built is actually a kind of a metadata lake. Uh, linking to uh, many uh, backend resources uh, and and actually aggregating in this way uh, data sets that are coming up coming from uh, you know various institutions various backends uh, in a standardized way. Uh, so that's the uh, that's the principle of the uh, of the uh, uh, COMP. I think there's not that many uh, distributed platform, distributed data uh, management system uh, uh, that uh, has been you know shown to be working uh, properly uh, so far. Uh, and we based our like you know backend aspect on a, on a very powerful uh, 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 software which is called DataLad. Uh, so this is the type of, uh, you know, the plat what the platform will give you, uh, it's, it actually shows uh, more than today 70 data sets, but also pipelines that are research uh, objects on their own. And, they, and we use for the description of the data set, something that has been built uh, with the BioCAD uh, NIH uh, uh, project, which is the DATS model, which is the description of the, uh, of the data model, a little bit like what uh, JATS is doing for a publication in its own world. Uh, the, uh, the pipelines themselves, we, uh, we describe them in a standard way with a boostic that's actually linked to a container so that we can actually launch uh, 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 pipelines on, on those data sets when, uh, when possible. Uh, and there are still many backends, and Zenodo is one of them, OSF is one of them. Uh, some of our own infrastructure uh, uh, databases are, are, you know, is one of them, and so on. So the, the idea really here is to uh, gather all those infrastructures and and centralize, or, or in a distributed way, centralize the uh, uh, the metadata uh, search. Uh, so now, now you can actually search across data sets and find data sets in neuroscience, uh, and that's an experiment, of course. Uh, the thing that I really wanted to have for the MNI and for the research community in Parkinson and other uh, neurological disease is actually to get to the data themselves at the individual level. Uh, so for this, uh, uh, we went through the, the journey of actually uh, finding a way of describing in a standard way uh, the uh, the individual data, uh, the individual sample level, uh, with the the problem of of course having the uh, the privacy and the uh, governance uh, embedded, and so the way we uh, we did that was to uh, link to uh, servers that actually don't have to give you the answer if you don't have the credential, uh, but still have those metadata, the sample level uh, shareable. Um, and uh, and here you see, for instance, a, a, a screenshot of a, a research of a search across uh, 200 data sets and uh, uh, 10,000 subjects, uh, which have you know neuroimaging and instrumental uh, uh, instrument data and so on. And, and you can do all the search and, and sifting across all those subjects and actually get data from, uh, for instance, uh, here like a, you know, uh, uh, lower than 50 uh, years old or you know, with a UDPRS of um, uh, more than 60 um, and, and find those uh, subjects that match those description because we had gone through the normalization and the standardization at the level of the sample. Uh, so the key to success in that uh, specific uh, you know, project was to define very precisely what is the fair use case that we want to solve. Solving for all the fair aspects was absolutely not an option, uh, given the resources that we had. 
secondly, to really involve right away and right from the beginning all the stakeholders and the governance and the ethical aspects uh, and work with the community and incentives. Uh, and I want to like uh, point to the, the problem that, uh, again, the research community is very much focused on the publication and as a currency, uh, one solution to this is actually to make uh, a you know, data set a publication with like a, a visible uh, impact on the community. That's the path that uh, scientific data has done, uh, has, has taken, and uh, that's the path that you know our own project uh, uh, with the uh, new imaging community aperture is doing as well. Um, and that's uh, that really is what uh, I think the you know the push should be that you know the, the first publication of a project should be a data set publication uh, with peer reviewed and with the recognition from the community of that uh, of of this uh, of this publication. Um, the, the third thing, the fourth thing, is that uh, uh, we absolutely have to have a common language uh, to search for data sets or to search within data sets. And that really cannot be done without proper standards uh, and proper communities that actually adopt those standards. And in the new imaging community, we have this fantastic example, which is the brain imaging data structure, which actually now have you know, spread around the world. And we can have, we have now a way of describing our data set to some extent uh, in a standard way. Uh, so I think, uh, you know, this building on this success, we really have to think of community building in terms of standardization. For this, I would point to the uh, neuroscience standards and the uh, and specifically the NCF, uh, the International Neuros uh, Neuroinformatic um, uh, Coordinating Facility uh, based in Stockholm, because they are the ones that are stamping uh, standards to be uh, proper standards, useful, documented, and so on. So that's, I think uh, we have really have to engage with those communities and those standardization aspects if we want to get our data fair. Uh, and, and obviously there are several levels and, and layers of standardization from the, uh, the, uh, the most uh, ubiquitous aspect to the most uh, specialized uh, from the specific communities aspect. Uh, and, you, and, and for neuroscience, I would really advocate that we join the INCF to do this. So conclusion uh, quickly, uh, I think we, we really have to invest in both the technical and the governance aspect of our data, as of course uh, has been uh, described before. But uh, but for the researchers, uh, it, it is still uh, it, you know something that is not uh, uh, there's no clear way of how to do this. The distributed uh, uh, data set aspect is probably one of the way we can keep the governance locally while distributing the uh, the description and the links to actually access the data um, if uh, those are. Uh, uh, you know, uh, available for people with the right credential. Uh, engage with the communities. This is not a journey that we can do alone. There's so much uh, individual or, or small group uh, efforts into uh, you know, uh, describing the data in a specific way. Uh, we really have to talk to each other and, uh, and, and get coordinating organization to help with the uh, standardization and find, again, find a common language that is not only a human language, but also a, a computer language so that uh, computers can understand uh, those data uh, right away. Um, contribute to the change of culture with training and education. Uh, there's still a bit of a, uh, I'm, I'm uh, amazed that uh, there's so few uh, uh, courses that actually, you know, explain those problems uh, and, and how to go with a verification of data uh, in university courses. I think there's, we're still lacking behind uh, uh, in, the, in that respect. And again, think about the, uh, what Carol Goebel, I think, uh, was uh, describing the incentives aspect. Uh, I think we really have to focus on what are the incentives. And there are, you know, as she was saying, like there was, there's love, money, fame, and rules. Uh, love because, you know, if you are a grad student and really want to do something, you'll do it. You want to, you want to share something, you, you will do it. And that's because you just want to do it. And that's, what, that's the love aspect. Uh, monetary incentive, um, uh, recognition from the community, but also funding and institutional uh, oversight and, and uh, regulation are also incentives that uh, we really have to increase uh, uh, for, the, uh, for, this, uh, for this journey to be successful uh, eventually. Uh, and I would just like to uh, acknowledge uh, many of the projects I'm working on uh, in this area and, uh, and many of the colleagues that uh, have been uh, uh, helping me in that journey as well. Thank you very much, uh, Jean-Baptiste, um, for the talk and uh, for staying 
for staying to time. Also, also Philippa as well. Everyone is being very, uh, very good with their timekeeping. Um, I'm just pausing for a moment in case anyone has a has a burning question. Um, but yes, the love, money, fame, and rules has already struck 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 me as a as a as an interesting way of thinking about uh, the system. Okay, so assuming there are no burning questions then we can move on to our final presentation and we have Claudia Engelhardt who is going to be talking about how to make your data fair some practical tips um take it away when you're ready ah uh, yes thank you Ian um and thanks to the organizers for inviting me um, for the opportunity to speak here. I'll share my screen now. One second. So you should be able to see my slides now. Yes. And uh, now in the presenter's view. Yes. Okay, great. So I'll also try to stay within my 10 minutes, which is challenging, uh, but let's see. So um, as Ian mentioned in the beginning, there are a lot of different stakeholders involved in, in making data fair. And in my talk, I'm trying to show a few or point out a few things that researchers can do to make their data fair. Um, and yeah, as I have to stay within, or as I only have 10 minutes, um, this is by no means exhaustive, but um, I'll try to cover the most important points. Before I start, I want to mention that um, I'm reusing most of the slides from my Fair's Fair colleague, Joy Davidson, who's actually also here, um, I think. So thanks a lot, Joy. Um, yeah, before I start with um, the topic, actually, a few words on the Fair's Fair project. Um, the aim of Fair's Fair is to foster fair data practices in Europe. It's a um, EU funded project running um, for three years. It ends in February 2022, so soon. Um, yeah, and 22 partners are working on different aspects rel related to fair and making data fair. Um, some recent outputs. So we, we are active in many different areas. These examples here um, are from the training and education area. So one thing that could be of interest, I think, to some people here is a handbook on how to be fair with your data, a teaching and training handbook for higher education institutions, which contains, for example, competence profiles for bachelor, master, and PhD students, uh, learning outcomes, and 16 lesson plans um, for um, different fair-related aspects. There's also a good practices report in fair competence education, highlighting six examples of universities trying to implement um, fair and integrate it into their teaching and curricula in different ways. Um, and there's also a data steward training online course, which actually um, most of my slides are taken from, which was created in cooperation with EOSC Synergy. And uh, many, many more interesting things, uh, which you can look up on fairsfair.eu or the Zenodo Fairsfair community. But let's now get to um, the main um, theme of the presentation, some practical messages about making data fair. So first of all, I'd like to note that um, fair or fairness um, is not an absolute state, but is rather a continuum. And in many cases, it is not possible or also not sensible perhaps to make data fair to the fullest extent. So either, or so be it that um, the infrastructure is not in place yet, or there are no standards available for that specific discipline, um, or the costs of making the data fair because it does require effort, um, outweigh the benefits of, of um, publishing it, for example. Um, in the following, I'll try to um, point out a few measures that researchers can do. These are not exhaustive um, and I have to be brief. So 
forgive me for that, but I hope I'll cover the most important points. So the first thing that researchers can do is make use of a data repository, either to look for data that um, they can potentially reuse, but also, of course, to publish their own data. Um, it is advisable to try uh, to choose a fair aligned repository that is ideally certified, for example, by the core trust seal. And when it comes to the question of, um, of the type of repository to choose, usually um, it is advised to prefer a domain specific repository because um, they do have experience with the data types used in a specific field or discipline. Um, they do have expertise in, in um, maintaining it, preserving it, um, making it fair and interoperable, um, and um, adhere to domain specific standards. Now, domain specific repositories are not available in all, all disciplines or all fields. And the second best choice um, can be an institutional repository. If that is not available either, there are generalist repositories available, for example, Zenodo, Figshare, or Dryad um, that we heard of earlier in this webinar. Um, well, there are a lot of repositories out there, um, and it might be difficult to find the ideal or right repository for you. There are tools that can help with this, um, namely registries. A very well-known one is re3data.org. It's a global registry of research data repositories um, currently containing about 2,700, 2,800 entries. And it provides a number of filtered search and browse options. Um, which also provide criteria that can help you to choose the repository. So you can example check, okay, are different access categories provided, which licenses are used, are persistent identifiers um, provided or supported, and if yes, which ones, is the repository certified, does it um, use, or which standards does it use, um, does it have a policy. Another, um, resource that you can use to find um, a repository is fair sharing. Also very important, of course, is to describe your data in a proper and um, a detailed way, if possible, with metadata. Um, a very important point is that the metadata should be readable both for humans and also for machines, um, because the machine readability um, makes it possible for the data to be found by aggregators and greatly enhances the visibility and findability. Um, so to make the metadata machine readable, they should ideally be structured in a standardized way. Um, it might be tricky or it can be tricky to choose the right standard. There are resources available to, can help, that can help with this. So there's um, guidance by the DCC, for example. There's a metadata standards catalog that um, is um, an outcome of a research data alliance activity. And um, fair sharing also provides um, information on standards. Um, in terms of metadata and interoperability, uh, it is also very recommended to make use of controlled vocabularies and ontologies to, to standardize the metadata. So in the left part of the slide, here we see an example um, that shows different ways of referring to humans. Um, which of course is, if it's used in different data sets that shall be um, or should be combined, um, not very good for interoperability. Um, and controlled vocabularies can help with that. Um, also ontologies are a very good way to, um, yeah, structure your data um, in a hierarchical way. 
Um, more information on these topics is provided on the GoFair website, for example, which is linked um, in the upper, uh, no, the lower right of the slide. So, to um, really benefit from making your data fair, a good thing to do is also to use persistent identifiers, not only for your data, but also for other research outputs that you're producing, for example, your publications, um, also an identifier for yourself, like the, the ORCID, and to link the research outputs um, by their identifier. So for example, um, if you just publish your data set, it might be hard to make use of it or, or make sense of it without um, much relating information. And so um, it's beneficial to link that data set to your publication or to the publication that um, it underpins and link both the publication and the data set um, to your ORCID, of course. Um, when publishing data, don't forget to um, provide a recommendation on how you want your data to be cited. Um, guidance on data citation is, for example, available um, at the DCC website. And if you use data of others, don't forget to cite it. On the other hand, so only a few minutes left. Let's go on. Also, if you publish your data, make sure that you do use a license um, because only a license provides clarity regarding the conditions of use or reuse of the data. Um, and if no license is provided, it's very hard for, for other people to use the data in a legally safe way. There are different types of licenses. I'm not going into detail now, but um, Creative Commons uh, licenses are very uh, well known and widely used. There are also special software licenses. You can find more information um, on these here. Finally, a note on um, sensitive data uh, or closed data. So a misconception that is probably still common is that um, fair and open are kind of the same thing, but they are actually not. And even data that cannot be made openly available because it's sensitive for whatever reason can be made fair. And um, researchers benefit from making this data fair as well because they are then better maintained, well structured and so forth. Um, and also, even if the fair, uh, if the data cannot be made available or completely open, it can still be made available um, with restrictions, for example. So this is something that should be considered. And there are also, of course, um, measures such as anonymization of pseudonymization that um, in searches can, uh, researchers can engage in. So finally, um, when it comes to choosing the data, that shall be published or maintained for the long term. It's also good to keep in mind that not all data needs to be kept forever. Not all data needs to be published um, because of course it is an effort to make data fair. Um, and there are a number of criteria that you can think about and you can follow um, when making this decision. Um, here you see five steps um, to decide what data to keep also from DCC guidance. So for example, um, consider if this data can actually be reused and can be of, of potential value to others. Um, some data must be kept as evidence for legal reasons or because it has other or great potential value. Um, do try to have a balance between the costs of making the data fair or making the data public um, and the potential benefits. Um, and one thing that's actually not mentioned on this slide, um, but that's also a criterion, is um, can the data be reproduced? Because some data, so meteorological data, for example, um, cannot be reproduced. And so it's lost forever if it's lost. So this is um, also um, a strong pro for data to keep. 
Um, and that was it from my side. So it was very brief. There is, I had to be somewhat superficial in some cases, but I hope it was um, informative. Um, oh no, I did keep these two extra slides. Yeah, what <laughs> is also important to stress um, what, and think about or keep in mind when making the data fair and thinking about all the effort that it's required is to keep the benefits of course in mind. So, um, which are, for example, um, making data fair helps to prevent data loss. It actually does increase citations. There are studies that um, show that. Um, it increases the impact of, of your research. It's easier for reporting purposes. Um, and there are a few more. So, okay. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, um, I'm happy to answer them here or later. If you want to get in touch, here's my email. Um, so what I would ask now, all of the speakers, Jen, Philippa, Jean-Baptiste, if you could make sure your camera is on, please. And also I'm hoping that James McRae will also be joining us uh, on the panel part. Are you there, James? There you are. Sorry, I just had to move the Q&A out of out of the way on on my screen um so we have a few a few questions that we can tackle but what i would first do um james i just wanted to offer you uh a, a minute to introduce yourself or, or react to anything that you've heard today just a minute um so yeah i'm uh, head of metabolomics here at the crick and i guess one of the reasons why i've been asked along today is um, not so much because of my expertise on, on uh, this topic, but because I think with metabolomics especially, and I'm not sure who else is online in my field or related fields like proteomics, uh, the sharing of data is becoming ever more important. And again, the speakers have already mentioned this, uh, uh, the importance of the metadata and the quality of the data itself uh, two particular things that I find uh, uh, ultimately very important here. And uh, maybe I'll come back to it later, but I, I think that that is the crux really of uh, the importance of fair data. I'll, I'll, if you asked me to react and um, I've got a, a few things that uh, uh, piqued my interest, but I guess following on, because it's fresh in all of our minds, um, about Claudia or the question that was asked of Claudia, I would always put a specialist uh, repository or database at the top of my list over a uh, institutional one. I don't know if if you would you've got any thoughts on, on that. Um, yes, of course. Um, but uh, if a specialist repository is not available, so then the second best choice is an institutional one and then if that's not available either the generalist one so i agree with you uh on this point and um yeah yeah obviously there, as we've already discussed there aren't specialist repositories all over the place i was also thinking though um surely or or maybe not i'm i'm, I'm pleading naivety um institute to institute quality of uh, such repositories is going to vary perhaps more than the um, the global ones that are the alternative. Um, yeah, I, don't, I don't know what you think about that. We can, I, I was, so, sorry, Claudia, I don't know if you had a thought coming, but I was going to suggest it would be interesting to hear Jen's uh, perspective on, on repository characteristics. Um, these, the, what, what, what do you make of the last? I was just throwing a, a comment into the into the chat, Ian. I think there are a lot of um, important questions here. So the thing that I threw into the chat was the type of material, because you know, as um, uh, all types of repositories kind of mature, um, they are growing in their own kind of expertise and appropriateness for different formats. So um, GitHub um, for um, for strong users is the best place to go for for software. It feels like, but you know, if you've got proteomics, you want your that work to go into the, the proteomics um, repository. So lots of different um, interesting questions. Well, it's, it's one that we um, talk to institutional libraries about often because 
uh, they're asking themselves where to where to focus their resources. So they may have an institutional repository already, but it might not have gained the traction that they hoped in, in, in 15 years because there's a huge burden of work, right, in faculty engagement and providing that domain level expertise. So um, so it's a, always a challenge for all of us to, to balance the um, the investment of, of resources and the return. So um, so our the, the institutions that we partner with are find that that Dryad is a good plugin um, to provide support for data in, in particular. Um, and also the data curation network is something that's emerged in the US as a, a library um, institution based cross uh, country initiative to provide domain specific support for for data curation. So a multifaceted question, I'm not sure that I would. Um, I'm not sure I feel confident about an uh, exact hierarchy, though I completely agree that for research purposes, if there is an available subject repository that's appropriate for your work, it's got to go there because that's where your colleagues are looking for it. I, I see a hand raised, Jean-Baptiste. I was, I was going to say that uh, the general uh, repository versus the specialized one are not necessarily uh, 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 contradictory in some sense. Uh, like you know, could definitely def you know describe your data set, push your data set in a specialized uh, uh, infrastructure, and describe it you know with uh, schema.org such that it's uh, it's available on Google you know search for data sets. Uh, so so the the you know the the, fact, the 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 actual problem is to make sure that those things are described the same way such that uh, you know across uh, infrastructure they can be found, which is really I think the uh, the, uh, the the problem that we have, the language that we don't, we haven't defined. Uh, Thank you. Um, in the interest of, of treating a number of different topics, I was going to move on to a different one because there's a, there's, there's a question for Philippa in, in the Q&A um, on a different aspect of this discussion. And, and Philippa, uh, the question is, uh, you mentioned underrepresentation of low and middle income populations. Do the FAIR data principles make it clear that LMIC populations and other such groups may not be fully represented? Is it or should, or should it be written into the way, way the data is described? Yeah, well, that's a great question. And I guess there's a kind of, there's a multifaceted answer. So if you just sort of take the FAIR acronym, then all data really should be treated equally. And so that would kind of give Philippa, we've just lost you. You've frozen. I don't know if you can still hear us. Equal representation. Yes. I don't know if you can still. Sorry, this is my connection. Yeah. Let me try just... I'm, I'm going to turn my camera off just in case that helps. Go for it. Um, if you just want to take it from the top with your answer. Yeah, sorry about that, everyone. Um, so, I, I mean, I think it's a very good question. I think if you just take the FAIR acronym, um, then there would be equity and representation because, you know, this is, is a sort of umbrella that includes all different kinds of data from all sources. Um, but actually, given the kind of gross inequities that we work with and, and under representation of some populations, it's a really interesting thought as to whether there should be in some way, a kind of special mandate for representation of data from particular settings. And it, it actually does link in with the discussion that we've just been having around where people put data and how, because, you know, those of us who are, who are lucky enough to work in big institutes have access to librarians and repositories and um, IT support and all sorts of, of means to kind of curate and share our data. Whereas from different settings, people just may not have that. And, uh, you know, I think also access to kind of education about how this works. There are kind of gross inequities in, in access to, you know, thinking about how you share and why you share data. So I think there is a big um, gulf there to be met. I'd, uh, that's probably only a partial answer. I'd be interested to know if if others have got have got comments, but it's a, it's a very interesting question. Um, yes, thank you. I think continuing with that theme, does anyone have anything to offer on, I suppose, more broadly, um, uh, research data sharing or infrastructures and, and support for lower middle income countries or, or inclusion of lower middle income countries? Does anyone have any other thoughts to add?
I can explain the silence perhaps a little bit, uh, which is to say this is a this is a huge challenge, you know, that just just hasn't been cracked yet. You know, um, is it is it equitable to bring in established infrastructures into uh, communities that haven't got their infra their own infrastructures, or is it better to work from the ground up and help them to develop infrastructures with the resources that they have? I mean, I I don't know um, the answers, but I'm I'm, per I'm personally very committed to working with the people on the ground that I've not had the chance to interact with before to find out what they think and how I can best support them without dominating the conversation. Thank you. Just searching around, there's some healthy discussion going on amongst attendees. Um, we have another question about repositories, but I thought I might just pose a slightly different one for the panel and, and I'll, I'll target it initially at Jean-Baptiste actually. And so I was, I was curious, you were talking about a community specific journey or use case in, in your talk. And I, I'm curious, what impact have you seen on, on neuroscience and neurology research as a result of, of, of implementing fair data? Uh, I think the, um, uh, the bid standard is if it Standard, standards have, have really had a big impact uh, in terms of uh, findability of data. Uh, so if you go to Open Euro and uh, you find like uh, 200 data sets uh, and you can you know, download them, and the efficiency of the processing that you can do when you have a standard uh, for data sets is amazing. Like, you know, you can, you can actually make your software uh, standard uh, aware of the uh, and and therefore you know limit the number of uh, errors and 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 really increase the efficiency of of uh, the processing aspect which is becoming much less manual uh, when such uh, standard processing exists you can you know okay, so we have like a, a bids apps if you want that say hey i know that that asset is in bids uh, i can uh, process it right away because you know i know this the, you know how it, it's formed and uh, and what's the metadata and those things. Uh, so, so there's clearly like a, an, an, an incredible efficiency uh, aspect as well as a uh, uh, as question that we could never ask because it would take, uh, you know, months and years to aggregate data sets uh, that we can now ask across, you know, uh, hundreds of data sets. So I think that's, that really has had, a, had a, you know, quite a serious impact. Um, Would anyone like to to comment or respond to 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 that response or talk about impact, either intended or unintended, um, of of fair data? One thing I could add is. Um, uh, uh, you know, bits is uh, often described by people as a bad standard. Uh, it's uh, you know it has its own limitation. It's uh, it doesn't uh, you know uh, standardize everything, and uh, so there's uh, still a lot of uh, sometimes manual aspect to be done. Uh, I just want to say because it is a standard, even if it's bad, uh, you know it has uh, it, it has really has spread and 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 aggregates a, a large community. And I think uh, you know the answer to that is really a bad standard is almost often better than a. a you know, like a, a, a better one that we, is, is still not, uh, you know, uh, very widely used. And that's the, uh, uh, that is why I think the, the community building and the, uh, and the, uh, the you know, uh, scientific societies or uh, even publishers, and like, you know, they really have their, their role to play, uh, you know, in, in, this, in this sphere for like uh, making uh, research uh, much more uh, interoperable and, and, uh, and discoverable across, across uh, uh, infrastructures and across data sets. Just uh, a lot of productive discussion um, about data catalogs and um, what have you. Um, I think we have what looks like a question ha has arrived from, from Lawrence Horton in the chat. Um, the issue of capturing good metadata often involves significant resources, especially if there's mediated deposit. Who is prepared to fund that? So let's assume it's not a rhetorical question um, and see who, who would like to respond to the question of funding uh, metadata uh, capture. It's actually one of the questions I have as well. I mean, there's nothing more 
frustrating than when you go to the method section of any paper and um, key bits are, are missing. And the same goes for, for data as well, where that key part of the metadata is absent and renders the data itself meaningless. That in itself is one of the, the key reasons why FAIR data is so important. Um, but I had the same thing. So uh, the same question is, um, sorry, I can't see who it was, uh, as Lawrence there. If we, we see this, or well, let me rephrase, one of the um, things that I wonder about moving forward, that one of the great benefits of making all data fair is that it will, um, or it should give a wonderful collection of data that can be interrogated uh, via machine learning AI. Uh, and what already talked about that, but that's only really, um, or that is maximally useful, if you like, if the data that it is interrogated is correct quality. So one thing that I wonder about is um, where is the where is that curation happening? And with the vast volumes of data that we can uh, realistically expect to see when Fair really get, uh, gets up and running, I just uh, it's one of my little concerns that if we don't do this. Uh, with great rigor now, are we going to make a mess in the future for those people who are trying to interrogate that? Perhaps not manually so much, but those uh, machine learning um, aspects. Thanks. Uh, Jen's got a hand up and, and also um, you had a question about um, uh, the curation checks at Dryad earlier in the discussion, Jen. So please, please go ahead and, and respond. Thank you. Um, I just want to react to the question about about funding. Um, I, I first like to say, you know, even if it's not clear how this is going to be supported in the long term kind of permanently, let's not let that dissuade us. Let's not let that slow us down. You know, the you know, the world will will sort itself out as it as it's sorting out these these other opportunities um, for research sharing and openness. Um, uh, so, I mean, I, obviously, uh, I did totally support, you know, the importance of, of the rigor of the metadata uh, for, for all, you know, all the reasons we've, we've talked about today. And, you know, as a kind of a nod of encouragement and through Dryad and, and other platforms, you know, the institutions and the publishers are investing in this now. So there is, you know, good, good potential growth there. But I'm also, um, you know, curious how we might begin to leverage some of the uh, is it is it machine learning tools and the and the AI tools as part of these processes? So um, I'm most familiar with eLife, uh, where where I was before Dryad, and we were I'm doing open source technology development to scrape as much from the author submitted manuscript as possible to limit the work that the author needed to do in 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 presenting their submission for peer review. So taking as much as possible from from that PDF and and sending it into the submission system. So. Uh, I bet there's work happening around data as well. I bet that that uh, maybe JB your outfit is, is doing some of this work too to pull pull the the things um, from from the the raw package from the researcher and translate that into metadata fields. So I'd be curious to know how we might um, invest in that and begin to get ahead of the curve and create scale and cost efficiencies that will benefit us farther down the line. Thank you. Um, I'm mindful we have less than three minutes left, so I want to be respectful of any commitments, meetings or, or otherwise people have to get to after this session. Um, I will pause just to see if anyone has any, um, I can't invite everybody, but if anyone has any, has any important closing remarks um, who either hasn't spoken for a while or wants to react, um, please do so now. Um, we can't hear you. If that, if that was Philippa coming in, we heard you for a second and then dropped off, I'm afraid. I think one thing I might say. Um, Sorry, my internet connection gives up as soon as I try to speak, inevitably. Um, we can, can you we hear can me hear, now? We can hear you now without the video. Go for it. Um, I was just going to say there is a lot of really interesting um, 
kind of points in the chat which aren't necessary which haven't necessarily been questioned but there's a lot of really good references and suggestions and links so thanks everyone for posting them and i don't know if there's any way the organizers can share any of that or well, some of it's going on to twitter but thanks everyone who's commented because there's some really nice feedback and interesting links thanks um any other final burning comments Okay, I can't wait the requisite 20 seconds, I'm afraid, um, so that we stay on time. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, I will say thank you uh, to all of the speakers, panelists. Thank you in particular to, to Frank and, and Kate and Karen for hosting and organizing. Um, and um, thank you everybody for all the, for all the engaging discussion. Um, there is some chat going on about how we, how we capture all that discussion. I'm sure a solution will be fined. Uh, will be found um, and um, yes hope to see many of you virtually or otherwise at the next Open Research London event. Thank you everybody, have a good day. <laughs>